Hey, we're in uh, Ecclesiastes chapters 4 through 7. We're reading in the New Living Translation. Uh, We find some sad verses as we begin chapter 4, especially in verses 2 and 3. Solomon is in uh, such deep despair. Uh, He feels that it's better to be dead than it is to be alive. And in fact, Jesus even mentioned one man who he felt would have been better off if he had never been born, and that was Judas. But Solomon just then changes his perspective just a little bit and, and with the realization that contentment in God is the key. And so notice these themes as as we read chapters 4 through 7. Hard work uh, and success are good, but it's not to be envied, but they're good. Uh, Laziness is wrong and destructive, and contentment, be content with what you have. And then relationship, Solomon is going to say, is the key. Others in a relationship help us to become productive. Uh, Others helps us in in times of need. Others helps us to bring comfort. And then others brings us safety and security. Uh, So as we get into that, uh, let's begin Ecclesiastes chapter 4, New Living Translation. Again, I observed all the oppression that takes place under the sun. I saw the stars of the oppressed with no one to to comfort them. The oppressors have great power and their victims are helpless. So I concluded that the dead are better off than the living. But most fortunate of all are those who are not yet born, for they have not seen all the evil that is done under the sun. Then I observed that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. But this too is meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. Fools fold their idle hands, leading them to ruin. And yet, better to have one handful with quietness than two handfuls with hard work and chasing the wind. I observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is the case of a man who is all alone without a child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But then he asks himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It is all so meaningless and depressing. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. It is better to be a poor but wise youth than an old and foolish king who refuses all advice. Such a young youth could rise from poverty and succeed. He might even become king, though he has been in prison. But then everyone rushes to the side of yet another youth who replaces him. Endless crowds stand around him, but then another generation grows up and rejects him too. So it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. As you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. It is evil to make mindless offerings to God. Don't make rash promises and don't be hasty in bringing matters before God. After all, God is in heaven and you are here on earth, so let your words be few. Too much activity gives you restless dreams. Too many words make you a fool. When you make a promise to God, don't delay in following through. For God takes no pleasure in fools. Keep all the promises you make to Him. It is better to say nothing than to make a promise and not keep it. Don't let your mouth make you sin. And don't defend yourself by telling the temple messenger that the promise you made was a mistake. That would make God angry, and he might wipe out everything you have achieved. Talk is cheap, like daydreams and other useless activities. Fear God instead. Don't be surprised if you see a poor person being oppressed by the powerful and if if justice is being miscarried throughout the land. For every official is under orders from higher up, and matters of justice get lost in red tape and bureaucracy. Even the king milks the land 
for his own profit. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. But what good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? People who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much. But the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. There is another serious problem I have seen under the sun. Hoarding riches harms the saver. Money is put into risky investments that turn sour, and everything is lost. In the end, there is nothing left to pass on to one's children. We all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty-handed as on the day we were born. We can't take our riches with us. And this, too, is a very serious problem. People leave this world no better off than when they came. All their hard work is for nothing, like working for the wind. Throughout their lives, they live under a cloud, frustrated, discouraged, and angry. Even so, I have noticed one thing, at least, that is good. It is good for people to eat, drink, and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life God has given them and to accept their lot in life. And it is good thing to receive wealth from God and the good health to enjoy it. To enjoy your work and accept your lot in life, this is indeed a gift from God. God keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. There is another serious tragedy I have seen under the sun and it weighs heavily on humanity. God gives some people great wealth and honor and everything they could ever want, but then he, he doesn't give them the chance to enjoy these things. They die, and someone else, even a stranger, ends up enjoying their wealth. This is meaningless, a sickening tragedy. A man might have a hundred children and live to be very old, but if he finds no satisfaction in life and doesn't even get a decent burial, it would have been better for him to be born dead. His birth would have been meaningless, and he would have ended in darkness. He wouldn't even have had a name. And he would never have seen the sun or known of his existence, yet he would have had more peace than in growing up to be an unhappy man. He might live a thousand years, twice over, but still not find contentment, and since he must die like everyone else, well, what's the use? All people spend their lives scratching for food, but they never seem to have enough. So are wise people really better off than fools? Do people gain anything by being wise and knowing how to act in front of others? Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Everything has already been decided. It was known long ago what each person would be, so there's no use arguing with God about your destiny. The more words you speak, the less they mean. So what good are they? In a few days of our meaningless lives, who knows how our days can best be spent? Our lives are like a shadow. Who can tell what will happen on this earth after we are gone? A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. And the day you die is better than the day you were born. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies, so the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. A wise person thinks a lot about death, while a fool thinks only about having a good time. Better to be criti criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. A fool's laughter is quickly gone, like thorns crackling in a fire. This also is meaningless. Extortion turns wise people into fools, and bribes corrupt the heart. Finishing is better than starting. Patience is better than pride. Control your temper, for anger labels you a fool. Don't long for the good old days. This is not wise. Wisdom is even better when you have money. Both are a benefit as you go through life. Wisdom and money can get you almost anything, but only wisdom can save your life. Accept the way God does things, for who can straighten what He has made crooked? Enjoy prosperity while you can, but when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in this life. 
I have seen everything in this meaningless life, including the death of good young people and the long life of wicked people. So don't be too good to or too wise. Why destroy yourself? On the other hand, don't be too wicked either. Don't be a fool. Why die before your time? Pay attention to these instructions, for anyone who fears God will avoid both extremes. One wise person is stronger than ten leading citizens of town of a town. Not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Don't eavesdrop on others. You may hear your servant curse you. For you, for you know how often your life, you yourself have cursed others. I have always tried my best to let wisdom guide me, my thoughts and actions. I said to myself, I am determined to be wise, but it didn't work. Wisdom is always distant and difficult to find. I searched everywhere, determined to find wisdom and to understand the reason for things. I was determined to prove to myself that wickedness is stupid and that foolishness is madness. I discovered that a seductive woman is a trap more bitter than death. Her passion is a snare and her soft hands are chains. Those who are pleasing to God will escape her, but sinners will be caught in her snare. This is my conclusion, says the teacher. I discovered this after looking at the matter from every possible angle. Though I have searched repeatedly, I have not found what I was looking for. Only one out of a thousand men is virtuous, but not one woman. But I find this. God created people to be virtuous, but they have each turned to follow their own downward path. So what you have here is a picture at the cemetery of the Uppsala Cathedral in Sweden. Uh, The Latin words there that that you see was uh, not very common in the day. Memento mori is a Latin phrase uh, loosely translated. It means remember that you are mortal or remember that you will die or remember your death. And the idea of memento mori and its symbolism uh, was really rare in classical days. Instead, they kind of followed the Dead Poet Society, carpe diem, all right, seize the day. It was popular, eat, drink, be merry, because you never know what's going to happen. So let's live it up today. The expression of memento mori developed with the growth of Christianity, uh, it, which of course, emphasized heaven and and hell and salvation and a future. So in the Christian context, this memento serves as a moralizing purpose. Unlike unlike the unbelievers of seize the day, Christians thought uh, of death reminded them that life is short, that it is precious. Take advantage of the time that you have. Don't worry about uh, the pleasures and the luxuries and all the achievements. Focus on what you can do for God. So if you uh, are mindful, let's, in fact, let's, let's just finish it like this. I think this is what Solomon might be saying, and this, this is going to be a good lesson for us to have and to pay attention to. If you are mindful of your last day, you might just not sin as much because you realize our life is short. I hope you have a great day. Stay in the Word. Bye.